uh, letting me know about the position. Um, I've lived in Marion Village for a little over two years now. Um, and I joined the association in December, so just for the beginning of this year. Um, I've had a really great time at the meetings I've been able to attend so far, and I'd really like to get more involved, um, both as the role of secretary since that's vacant, and definitely in getting uh, more membership with people I know who are active in the neighborhood, but who maybe don't even know about the association. So um, I'm really excited for the opportunity to be considered for the board, and I would love to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Lena? Yeah, Lena, this is Lauren. I was just wondering where in Marin Village you live. I am on Southwood, very close to High Street. Awesome. Any other questions for Lena before we move on to a vote? Okay, fantastic. We currently have a small group, so I'm just going to read through. Uh, I'll call your name, and when I call your name, please just let us know um, if you support, oppose, or abstain. So, first person I see here is Camille Gill. I support. Thank you very much, Camille. All right, next we have Kathy Hoyt. Support. Thank you, Kathy. All right, moving on, Lauren Larrick. Support. Thank you very much. Lena, <laughs> you're a member as well, so you get to vote. Awesome, I support. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> okay, moving on, Mark Huckabee. Overwhelmingly support. Thank you for filling this five-year position that we've been trying to fill. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Terry Porter. Uh, support. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Tom Les. Support and I'll echo. Thanks, Lena. Vicki Redderer. Um, support and I second that. Thank you for volunteering. We really appreciate it. And Kent Kent's is here, here with too, me too, and I support. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. All right. Great. Okay, looks like that is everybody that is on at present. So wonderful. Thank you very much. That is unanimous. So Lena, officially welcome to the board. Thank you again for volunteering and we're very excited to have you. So new official secretary. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, we will move on to the next item, uh, the Southside Scholarship. So I'm going to turn the floor over, floor over to our Vice President Lauren uh, to give an update on the scholarship. Hi, everyone. Um, so the Applications were due from Southside students on the 30th of April. Um, so we have a couple that have come in that the board or the committee will be um, reviewing here shortly and um, deciding what to do next and how to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Once the committee has uh, reviewed those applications and made a decision, we will certainly announce the winner or winners at uh, one of our monthly meetings. So look forward to that. Uh, okay, moving on, I'm going to give a quick recap of our 2021 spring yard sales. So um, as you mostly probably all know, we held our yard sale last Saturday from 9 to 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, we had about 48 locations registered, which included the two stops for the inaugural day of the South Side Market at Wanderlust and Austin and Company. Um, based on what I heard from folks who came to make donations uh, afterward for Goodwill, um, it was a it was a very successful day. Beautiful weather. We could not have asked for better weather, um, and folks really I think enjoyed the opportunity to to get out and and see people and um, you know have have an opportunity to do some training treasure hunting. So not sure if anyone here attended the sale or, or wanted to give any comments about anything cool they saw or the experience they had, but um, it was a really, really nice day and we're hoping that our sale in October will be just as nice. Uh, I will also update everyone. So for two hours after the yard sale, we held a donation drive in the info center. We partnered with Goodwill. They brought us 15 
giant bins a few days before that were about six feet tall and maybe four feet wide. Um, they brought 15 of those bins and we filled 13 of them. <laughs> so there were about 25 folks that came to the info center just in that two hour period and had tons of things to donate. A lot of those folks had had sales earlier in the day and they were donating any items they had left over. Um, but then we, we also had folks coming in that just doing some spring cleaning and wanted to get things out of their garage maybe. So really successful. Um, we hope to do that again in the future. It sounds like people really were happy to do that and, and we're glad that was available. So um, we'll certainly listen to you guys for feedback. And if that's something you want us to do in the future, we will uh, work to coordinate it. So thanks yes, for coming. Yeah. I had a quick question. Um, if you, sorry if you already said this. How many people do we have registered for the sale? We had a total of 48 locations. So that was 46 houses and then two locations that were at the Southside Market. Perfect. Yeah, it was great. Um, so always, always great to see that. It's, it's always such a fantastic event. And we get a lot of folks outside of the neighborhood who look forward to that event every year and start reaching out to us asking when it is. So we were really excited to be able to host it again this year. Uh, Jess, do you pick up, does someone pick up the signs or do I need to deliver my signs? Do you there? still have your sign? So we do um, have a wonderful volunteer who did pick those up the okay. day of the sale. Yeah, it's gone. Oh, it's okay, gone. Great, great. Wonderful. Yes, Michelle Kulowitz, if any of you know Michelle, she is phenomenal. She delivered all of the signs to houses and to like those common areas that you might mm -hmm. see high traffic. And then she picked them up the same day of the sale. She's fantastic. So we really appreciate her help. Yeah, great. They were nice signs. Yeah, they're great signs. We had to get a few more this year because our yard sale has been very popular, but that's that's always a, a good thing. So um, that's what some of those non-members pay a $5 fee to be registered on the map. And so that's what some of those costs help to support are things like those, those signs that we can reuse. So, yep, very, very great. Did you, did the event go well for you, Vicki? It sounds like you guys had a sale. Oh yeah, we did. I have a niece that's a first grade teacher in Appalachia and I always give her all my money from the yard sales. Nice. Site, and they buy, um, art supplies for kids. So. That's awesome. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for participating. Yes. Love it. All right. Um, I have the garden tour listed here. Allison Wilford is chairing that for us this year. It will be primarily virtual. Um, and then, of course, the front yards, again, similar to last year, actually identical to last year. Allison isn't here with us now, so I won't go too far into an update since I'm not the, the best person to give that. But the applications are open. So if you're interested in being on the garden tour this year, you can elect what type of participation you'd like to have, whether you'd want to just have a video done of your yard, uh, just have front yard the day, uh, the week of the sale, I'm sorry, the week of the garden tour, um, or both. So you, you really get the opportunity to kind of pick and choose what works best for your garden and your situation. And uh, if you didn't get an opportunity to look at the videos last year, Allison filmed and produced those and they were beautiful. Um, so check those out on our YouTube channel and it might be some incentive if you'd like to have your own garden featured this year. You can head over to marionvillage.org and fill out an application to be included on the tour. Okay. I'll talk briefly about our festival. So we did have the inaugural meeting of our festival committee a couple of weeks ago. We'll have another one here on the 12th of May. Uh, so far, the committee's just come together to see who's gonna volunteer this year, get an idea of who will fill which role, we're still discussing what the festival will look like, whether we will have um, a day of event in September as we have in the past, or whether we'll be doing smaller events throughout the entire summer. Obviously, we're not exactly sure where things will be with COVID in September, while we would like everything to, to be, you know, much better circumstance. Um, it's still a little up in the air. There are still extra requirements that the city and the state um, Department of Health have, have put out for events. Um, as you may know, the Arts Festival has been canceled. ComFest is exclusively um, virtual this year. So our committee is working together to figure out what our festival is going to look like, and hopefully we'll have some updates for you soon on that front. Okay, moving on. Uh, we will touch on committee updates. Beautification, Christian is not here with us tonight. I don't believe anyone here tonight is part of the beautification committee, so um, we will pass over that unless someone joins us from that committee. Let's see here. Uh, Lauren, is Mike with you? Anything from social that he would like us to know? I know the coffee event was held um, just last month, right? Yes, uh, we had a coffee event. I forget the day, a couple weeks. It was a Saturday or Sunday. Saturday, yeah, Saturday a couple weeks ago. Um, 
we had a good turnout. There's probably about 10, 10 plus people. Um, and there is currently nothing in the works yet. But again, if anybody has any good ideas that are, um, you know, still, into, yeah, still trying to be a little COVID friendly, um, but, you know, maybe starting to crawl out there with, um, if we can kind of have like the, the coffee idea was great. So trying to kind of do some things where we can get together, but outdoors would still be preferable. Um, if anybody has any ideas, let us know. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks, Mike, for organizing that. Um, really cool to have an opportunity to, to get out and about. So yes, like Lauren said, if you've got ideas, send them our way. Uh, let's see here. No updates really from the zoning committee tonight. Um, there were some questions that came up with demolitions and how the city handles those and what our level of participation is. Um, so we did just update the zoning guide that is on our website that talks about how our zoning committee handles different applications and then what that means for the membership. Um, if you'd like to check it out, it's at marionvillage.org on our zoning committee page, outlines how everything is handled. And then of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, we'll also get you connected with Lauren and make sure that you have all your answers. Okay. Uh, I'll go on to the block watch. So if you were here last week or last month at our meeting, um, we had some discussions about the connect to protect block watch, what that means now that the block watch is separate um, from the association and has been for some time. Um, we had talked about the association potentially sending a letter to the block watch to request that updates be provided directly to us at our meetings. Um, I actually had an opportunity to speak with D. D is uh, the current um, I think she's considered, not the, the president's the wrong word, but she's the coordinator for the overall block watch for all four of those neighborhoods. And so I let Dee know what kind of information people were looking for, um, a representative maybe that could come to our meetings each month and give those updates, or if a representative wouldn't be available, that perhaps she could send the updates to me and I could provide them at the meeting. Um, so Vicki is also from the Block Watch, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Vicki, in just a second here. But I am going to upload to chat. Dee sent a couple of um, documents to me to share with everyone. Uh, one is a document that kind of covers the structure of the Connect to Protect Block Watch. Um, um, how it's laid out, how people get involved, um, what everyone does as part of that block watch. And then the second document she sent to me is a summary of the activities that the block watch um, has undertaken since last April. So for the last, I guess, about 13, close to 14 months. So she wanted to share that with folks um, so people knew what the block watch has been doing, even though they haven't been able to meet during the pandemic. Um, so that's the information that we have so far. And Vicki, I'll let you kind of share when you may be giving updates or what that might look like and uh, take it from, take it away. Okay, hello. Yeah, um, are you, are the documents up yet? Yes, they're they're both in uh, they're both in the chat. And would you like me to bring either one of them up on the screen? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. I'll do the uh, the structure. We can go through the structure real quick first. Sure. One moment here. Okay. So, um, oh, that's that wasn't the that's not what. Hmm. I didn't think that was the one that she sent this morning. Let's look at the other one. Oh, the summary. Um, yeah, let's okay. try that. Sorry. Let's, no, that's okay. One second here. Yeah, she sent me both of those at the same time. So let me get that pulled up as well. Uh, she might have sent an update because she had a more summary, but mm. uh, go ahead. See okay. if you can get that in. Sorry. No problem. Okay, here's the summary she provided. Okay, we'll just start with that one. Okay. Um, I really kind of wanted to focus on what we have kind of in process now. Uh, in the summer, basically, um, a lot of the stuff Dee has taken on some of the action or, um, let's see, she met with Zach Klein and with other South Side block watches to kind of talk about, uh, to discuss the policies on bail and citations and um, police direction in November. Um, I'm sorry. The, she had sent a more updated one. I don't know what. Yeah, it looks like this is the only one I have yeah, from her, okay. I'm afraid. All right, that's all right. Let me find that one. Okay. Um, there is a second page, Vicki, with the 2021. We had some face-to-face uh, face -face meetings. Yeah, let's, I thought, since I don't have a lot of time, I'd rather go with more current what we're doing. Sorry. 
Okay, so in January, um, they issued a community crime alert when uh, there was a trend <clears throat> of armed violent robberies uh, were evident in the area. The alert was posted on our Facebook page next door and sent to Schumacher Place and Marion Village Civic Associations, as well as German Village Society with a, a request to disseminate the alert to the residents. Um, they worked with police and community members to shutter um, irresponsible, basically short-term units. Um, we had some issues where I think there was a shooting at, um, you know, like some overnight type rental places. So they've been working with the police on some of those issues where they had a large volume of people at parties. In March, um, she put, uh, provided some input to Rob Doran's um, aid on short-term rental property management. Um, and there was, in April, there was communicating with the citizen app support personnel regarding, there were some erroneous reports of um, some inaccurate gunfire that had occurred. So um, in May, they were beginning construction of a community garden at Southwood Elementary School. And one of the things that, um, like in process now, is we're basically attending uh, numerous, she's been attending numerous city council meetings, coordinating efforts to create the community children's guarding because um, there's some stats on how that can improve crime in the area. Um, currently working with local private and public entities to coordinate a helmet fund and hopefully bikes and do a giveaway um, in, a, in association with the Southside School. And we connected to Columbus Public Health and Southwood Elementary to try to institute a safe routes to schools program. And some ongoing things, um, they, she submits a lot of 311 tickets on issues if people want help with that for litter, for uh, street and alley lighting out outages, drug houses, rodents. Um, she'll interact routinely with the Shoah Park Recreation Center. Sometimes there's issues that go on there and we try to stay in the loop with what's going on at Schiller. Um, we maintain open communication with other block watches and what's going on basically in the 11th pre Our neighborhood, Marion Village is in two precincts and German Village and uh, Schiller, or German Village and um, Brewery District and Schumacher are also in one of those precincts. So um, we, she stays in contact with the liaisons for those to find out what's going on. There's sometimes when they can provide more detail what's going on, but it's an active investigation and Dee's not really allowed to specifically to discuss it. Um, she'll routinely work with the WEX, rec center personnel and then assist any residents. Like if you, if somebody dumps a bunch of tires, she'll work with the resident and help get a resolution to that. Um, some of the current issues that um, have been going on is, I don't know if anyone's aware of it, but recently over on Gates, there was um, a, a lady was putting her groceries in her, or taking her groceries out of her car like at nine o'clock at night. And she was attacked by three teenagers. They maced her, not maced her, they um, tased. tased her three times and were trying to take her purse and were being physical with her. She started screaming, the neighbors came out and her husband came out and the neighbors called the police. The girls took off, they were three young girls. They took off and her husband got in the car and followed them over to Shoulder Park. The police were able to go over there and the person who was attacked positively identified two of them. Um, one of the girls that was involved was on um, home monitoring home arrest and she was out. So two of the people were arrested. Don't know any more of the details at this point, but just be careful when you're doing things. There's, there's a lot going on. Um, Dee sent a letter to city council and the police regarding the homeless camp that's over under the Greenlock Bridge. Apparently um, there's been a lot of um, public defecation and there was a situation where someone's dog had eaten um, um, some of the human feces and it uh, had been contaminated with drugs and the dog had some reaction. So Dee has sent a letter to city council and to the police to try to help us clean up this camp that's been causing some problems in the area. Um, she's partnered with public service department of Franklin County 
uh, municipal court for monthly community cleanups. And um, they cleaned up the area around um, the freeway and Third Street. There was some homeless people living there and there, there was just a lot of trash in the area. It's been cleaned up, but they're going to be working on the alleys around Morrow and Hinman. Um, and also if they have extra time, Schiller Park, they're gonna come once a month. So if you have places where you notice there's a lot of trash, um, if you email connect to protect block watch at gmail.com, uh, Dee can ask them to go to those areas. She's kind of working closely with them. Um, so the next date that they're out to clean up is May 22nd. And then in June, it's June 26th, July 24th, August 28th and September 25th. So if you have ideas for that, where it would be helpful to have them clean up, just email connected protect block watch. If you notice something in your area that you need help with or you're having problems with, you can um, email connected protect block watch and uh, Dee can work directly with the um, uh, police on some of those issues if there's something ongoing or other people in the city, there's other people she does work with in the city when there's issue where there might be a drug house or you know to notify people to try to help get resolutions to some of the things that are causing problems in our area. Um, let's see, had a couple other notes. Um, the, kind of the way the block watch works is um, D is the coordinator, and <clears throat> then we have liaisons for each of the areas, and um, then there's captains. One of the things we tried to focus on right before COVID hit is we wanted to try to get a captain on each block, and the captain on the block was going to be like if something happened on your block you would reach out, on my particular block, I've reached out to all the residents. I'm trying to get everybody's phone number and text and email. And then when I'm aware of something that happens, I notify people in the area so that they're more aware of what could happen. And in the same instance, if they, if something were to happen to them, they could notify me. The other thing that you're able to do with that is if somebody leaves their garage door open or has a package sitting out there, they may not be aware. You can kind of alert people to help things that can eliminate some of the crime ahead of it happening. Um, and it can kind of go back and forth between the, the neighbors who are in the captain's area. So um, Kathy Hoyt's on the call. Kathy and I had just gone around and started to try to recruit some people to be captains. Then we would hope the process would go from the captain, um, the captains would notify the coordinator, the coordinator would know excuse me, notify all the captains, and then the captains and hence would notify everybody in their neighborhood to try to really keep open communication so people know what's going on and can help reduce some of the crime in their neighborhood and be more aware of what's happening. Um, there's, I had written down, oh, there's, in the four neighborhoods, there's 6,000 households. So a lot of the crime that occurs in Precinct 13 also occurs in Precinct Precinct 11. So it's a lot of the same people that are committing a lot of issues all across our neighborhoods. Um, there's actually over 10,000 population. So by combining these neighborhoods, we feel like we could have more input if we go to the city or police uh, when we can get more people involved in the block watch. So um, questions? Looks like Mark has a question, so I'm going to call on Mark. And then also, I did put that email address for the Block Watch into chat if anybody just wants to All grab right. it so that you've got it if you want to reach out to Dee. But Mark, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. That was a, a good update, and it sounds like there's some good work being done. What I'd like to know is, uh, what is the actual scope of practice for the Block Watch that uh, is supposed to be representing us now? And what are the core components of their duties? So what I, what I saw was some good work in a lot of areas, but the reality is many of those things are things that 311 is responsible for, codes is responsible for, civic associations are responsible for, or perhaps our neighborhood liaisons and commissioners. Uh, what I'm really interested in from a block watch are the core components of uh, crime, prevention, and safety. And I did see some items that certainly related to that, but uh, maybe I don't understand the uh, scope of practice for this group. I'm interested in uh, reducing gunshots. I'm interested in reducing the unlicensed vehicles that are flying through uh, my street at, you know, 60 miles per hour on mini bikes and motorcycles and quad runners. I'm interested in pedestrian safety. 
Uh, I'm interested in lighting and all of those things. I'm not interested at all in getting a 300 gallon uh, trash receptacle replaced. That's the job of 311 and, and other groups. I hate to see duplicative work, but I'd like to see and hear more about the core components of the safety watch in the block watch, please. Well, I think those are, sorry, I don't know if I'm still, yeah, okay. I think those are issues that the city council's working with. They're working on ways to reduce the gunshots and the uh, violent crime in the city. They have commissions and groups all over the city that are working on a lot of that. Uh, as a block watch, we're just trying to, as uh, best we can, keep our, our city safe. I'll look for um, some documents that we put together and forward what I have. If you, if I could get your, uh, if you send a note to the block watch email with your contact information, I'll forward some information to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really up to date on how they typically work. Uh, um, I've been in public safety for 41 years and, and all of those things. Uh, but I may not know, uh, you know, how Connect to Protect works. Uh, I'm also, I uh, have the experience, you know, of knowing how we worked prior to relegating those duties over to Connect to Protect. And it just feels like there's a difference. I'm not on any kind of mission. I purely want a block watch that's going to help protect me and my neighbors. Uh, and I don't mean that's a crime patrol, but I do, do believe it is police uh, liaisons. I believe it's hearing crime statistics, hearing the communications from the police department, um, I, I don't know. I, and, and it may be that that work's being done, but I can't imagine I'm the only one in Marion Village that doesn't understand it, perhaps. Maybe it just works differently than it used to when it was under us. Uh, and Jess, actually, I honestly don't understand how we got rid of our own block watch. I don't, I don't even understand how we subrogated it over to another neighborhood. So I don't know. I, I just may be uh, ignorant in some of this background and what the expectation is now. Maybe my expectation is, is not realistic. I can Thanks. give you a little bit of background on, on kind of how the Block Watch transitioned. Um, so the Marion Village Association uh, directly, we never had a formal Block Watch or a Block Watch that was um, sanctioned basically by CPD. What we had was the Marion Village Association Safety Committee. And so that committee typically would meet, uh, I believe it was every other month. And um, they, they would sometimes get liaisons from CPD to provide information, but the problem was because it wasn't a sanctioned block watch that information did not always come through and every time a liaison changed they had to attempt to get the liaison to provide information so there would be months if not years where essentially they couldn't get information at all. Um, so we had two residents, one in the 11th district and one in the 13th district here in Marion Village, who uh, there was a bit of a crime uptick and they really felt interested in starting an official block watch through the city. So in order to do that, they wanted to kind of look at converting um, what we had as a safety committee to a formal block watch. So uh, that was several years ago. The association took a vote on that and, and agreed that, yes, that would make the most sense. Um, so that became an official block watch through the, the city. While it was still technically part of Marion Village and, and part of the Marion Village Association. It was also, in a way, a separate organization. Um, one of those neighbors who got it started moved away, so he was no longer involved. And the other neighbor, Mary Cannon, who got things started, she continued to, to carry the block watch and, and keep everything organized for I think about three years. Um, when she was ready to step away, that's when Dee stepped in. Um, and then Dee worked with the city to kind of expand the program and worked independently on combining that program with the other three neighborhoods. So at that point, that was not something that the Marion Village Association had any kind of ownership of um, because it was sanctioned through the city. Um, but we remained part of of that as a neighborhood. Um, Vicki mentioned that the, the Block Watch serves about 6,000 residents, as I said. I think that was what over you said, 6, Vicki. 000, over 6,000 households, but over 10,000 right, right, exactly. residents in, in, the, in those households. And uh, I think about 30, 3,200 of those are actually in Marion Village alone. So we are pretty huge. Um, but the Block Watch, while there was at a time for about three and a half years, a block watch that served just Marion Village, it was still separate from the association. So yep. 
a little uh, just that's just kind of some of the background on on how that that transitioned um yep. i remember a lot of that and i attended uh pretty much all of those safety meetings Did you? That I the transition mm -hmm. uh somewhere i lost a connection when it actually transitioned to connect because we had stopped having the meetings mm -hmm. uh, i guess what i'm saying is uh when we're 50% of a 6,000 household block, and I've not once heard anything from the group who's supposed to be representing us, I've got a problem with that. You know, when I attended those meetings, yeah, there were meetings where some were skimpier than others, but honestly, we had a decent group at many of those for a long time. Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what the solution is. It's not gonna be one of us joining the block watch, right? Uh, so okay. even if we had the liaison to connect to connect, excuse me, connect, uh, I, I don't know that I'm still going to see or hear anything about anybody helping protect Marion Village. I'm, I'm, I know as long as we're in connect, we're all in it together. But the reality is I'm not interested in Livingston Avenue. I'm interested in Marion Village where my home is and my neighbors. Uh, I just want interaction and I want uh, engagement and I want data and I want stats and I want to know the plan. That's what we used to have with our safety committee and I've not heard of any of that, not one speck of it since it left us. And again, I could, I could have missed stuff, I could have done, but I, I think I do attempt to be fairly engaged and I just don't see anything, nothing. So that's, that's the reason I'm bringing it up. And the higher uh, the perception of crime increases, the more we hear our ring app screaming, was that gunshots? Was that gunshots? Well, maybe, probably not, but maybe, you know, we need to better understand that. I don't want me and my neighbor standing in our intersection anymore talking about the gunshots that were fired at Brock and Moeller. I'm tired of it. And I don't know anybody that's helping us and I'm ready for somebody to help us and we must help them help us. But right now I see no means to do that. That's my problem. Beth Fairman Kinney is on the line. Beth uh, works with the city. Beth Beth has a bit more information kind of about behind the scenes, how the Block Watch works with, with her and, and the city. Um, so Beth, if you want to just take a few moments and, sure. and maybe fill us in on that. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, so as your neighborhood liaison, um, I have been working with Connect to Protect Block Watch, and they've been involved with the Comprehensive Neighborhood Safety Strategy, which is out of our Department of Neighborhoods. And so I know that members of that group have been involved with those meetings. We meet quarterly. And if you are interested, if anybody here is interested in being a part of that next quarterly meeting, um, send Jess, I could put my email in the chat, or you can also contact Jess. Um, and so that's been a quarterly meeting. Also through our Department of Neighborhoods, you know, we've been, um, we've been doing that for a few, um, there's a little bit of everything. I work very closely with our CLOs and Marion Village has always been unique because you have 11 and 13. And I know with 13, we have had a lot of change. Right now we have Officer Peck, who is our current CLO. And one of the things that I know from personal experience when Connect to Connect was kind of formed, you know, it was um, a little bit easier. I remember when Marion Village had the block watch within the Marion Village Civic meeting, and it was, you didn't have a CLO be able to attend all the time because that CLO ha in 13 goes all the way to the city limits. So um, there's just so many meetings. So I know that I believe from what I've what's been shared with me when we used to do in-person meetings, it's a little different now, there was a little bit more availability to that CLO. Now the, those CLOs are still working in the neighborhoods, both with 11 and 13. And when it comes going into the summer, one thing, and Vicki, I don't want to steal your thunder. If you were going to share, we are doing um, safe streets again. And that uh, was just launched. And I do have um, an email, say, uh, I think it's safe Southeast, I'll find that. But we do have an email now for the safe streets that we're able to reach out to them in case of um, situations. So you're gonna see going into the summer, our officers on bikes like you had last year. Um, I actually got to present to um, some of them last 
week. So um, we're excited that they're going to be coming back and hopefully that will help. We know that the increase in crime um, and from both what Officer Medley and Officer Peck have shared me, this is citywide and we know that we're talking a lot. And I know, as you mentioned, Mark, I know you mentioned council is working on things, the administration is working on things. Um, we had uh, just last week on Monday night, the mayor and Director Pettis, we actually came over to um, we spoke with the coaches, uh, part of Legacy U, which is over there um, right around the corner from Community Grounds. Um, so we spoke with all the coaches um, to talk with them about how do we talk with, you know, how do we connect with the youth, you know, when it comes to the violence um, that's going on across the city. So there's a lot of strategies. I know we're doing a little bit of everything. I know as we go into summer, um, I've been talking with Recreation and Parks about some of the programming there's going, there is program at Schiller, Barrick, um, Marion Franklin, Scioto Southland, um, the pools I'm told may be open this year, summer, which will be great. So there's, there's a lot of strategies and we're continuing to, and I know there's been a lot of change. So that's just, I think that's a, a little bit of everything and I'm happy to answer questions, but um, I know with uh, working with Connect to Protect, um, they've been very active. Um, I know right now with uh, COVID, it's been not as easy to get together, but they have been active working with our neighborhood safety strategy. Um, Beth, thank you. I yes. was thinking too that uh, when the library re reopens, we will start having our meetings again. Um, as everybody knows, the police have been very busy right now and Officer Peck is doubling as a CLO. Um, in the 13th. He's over seven precinct and he's yeah. covering yeah. 13 because yeah. Officer Stacy got reassigned. They have a lot going on right now. I know she's getting the stats from them and she is posting the stats out on next door. The crime stats are out there for the neighborhood. So on the 13th and the 11th precinct. So, um, and D and I will continue to communicate with Marion Village until these meetings start back up. And now that Dave Rudak, who was in the, um, he was the representative from Marion Village uh, before he moved out of town, so. Well, thank you, thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Beth. That's that's a lot of great information. Um, and Vicki, I know that um, Dee mentioned to me that, you know, she will try to prepare um, summaries for us with, you know, local updates about Marion Village every couple of months that I can present if you yeah. aren't available to present in a time. So we definitely appreciate that as well. Um, I think uh, to, to Mark's point and Mark kind of in, in response, I think part of what Vicki talked about earlier with the, the idea and the hope of having the coordinators and the block captains that if the block watch is able to expand participation and start getting those folks that that could help to fill that, that kind of need and desire that you mentioned about those local communications is that, you know, those, those block captains and coordinators really Really could connect about a specific area rather than maybe all of the information if you're kind of looking for something specific. Um, but I will say if you do email D, you know, about a specific issue, she'll get back with you quickly. Um, I, there was a gentleman <laughs> over on Moeller and 8th who, I'm not sure why, decided to paint his own crosswalks across the street. Mm -hmm. um, a resident contacted the police department. It sounds as though they came out and kind of looked at it, laughed a bit, maybe told him to have a nice day and, and went on their way. So I actually kind of escalated that to D and she, she's actually working with the commander about that to figure out why that's happening and you know how we can prevent it because it could certainly cause an accident, which would be very, very bad. Um, so she's, she's very responsive um, if you do email her directly about a problem, but uh, Vicki, if there are campaigns that come up where the Block Watch is specifically trying to, you know, get more people involved to be those captains, um, let us know and we're happy to, to promote and share that. That is well, great. Yeah. If anyone would want to volunteer to be a captain, uh, I'd be happy to meet with them and kind of talk over the role. And I, we have forms to create because we did, we, we have a form that people can complete with their information. And then if ever they weren't home and something happened at their house and there was a fire, it would have a point of contact. The police would have somebody that some way to get in touch with somebody. 
And then as my own captain on my area, I'm making up a list for all my neighbors to have, you know, just to kind of alert each other if something's sure. going on. But and I also, and, and also I know things are really crazy with COVID, with our Black Watch meetings, as Vicki mentioned at the library, but everybody was welcome to come. We sometimes, you know, the Black Watch, we would only have five or six people in those meetings. You know, anybody who's interested could come and voice their concerns because we do have um, the police liaison there. So, you know, I don't know if the message isn't getting out that there's Black Watch meetings, but I know it's on the website. Well, we're not having them during COVID, Kathy, because right, the right. is allowing us in there right now. And it has to be at a place um, that has the type of access that the library has. So, um, mm -hmm. really And I'll just speak for, for us. When we hold in-person meetings as the association, our participation levels, unless there's something big happening, are typically lower. So yeah. that's a challenge as well as getting people to be able to physically go to a meeting, especially if they have other meetings in the community. Um, when we had the block watches, just Marion Village, that's part of why we had combined our safety meetings <laughs> and the block watches, because you could sometimes get people to come out for a back to back, but getting them to go to multiples was hard. So I think that's probably a challenge too, is in-person meetings are difficult since folks get home from work late or maybe they have kids at home um, and maybe they just don't want to be out after dark. So those virtual connections as well, I think, um, will be really helpful for folks to be able to look at updates online, whether it's next door or Facebook, communicate via email, and then certainly uh, if there's a network, if, if you start to get more captains and coordinators, I, I think that'll be helpful too. Um, I think when we had our combined meetings, it was hard to cover everything in both meetings. Just it right was a in. long meeting. It was a long meeting. <laughs> it seemed like we never got finished with the block watch stuff sometimes because uh, it was always the last one. But And I think when, when, when we had the block watch first, it was only about 30 minutes for the block yeah. watch. And then we stepped stepped in with our meetings. So it was a long meeting. I mean, participation yeah. was sometimes a little better, but again, it is very difficult to get folks to be able to consistently come out to meetings yeah. in person. Um, that's certainly a lesson we've learned over this last year is that um, it, when you can meet uh, remotely, I, I know that it, it is better, but I also know from Dee that the, that the liaison officers do not do remote meetings. And so that's, that's actually a big part of why the Block Watch isn't doing virtual meetings right now is because the liaisons won't attend, so it, it wouldn't necessarily um, be completely beneficial. So, yep, if we can stay connected virtually, that's always a good thing, too. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, of course. Any other questions for Vicki, even if she can't answer, that maybe she could take back, take back to D before we move on? Okay. All right. We're going to move on, then. Uh, so I've got here Southside Com Commission updates. Tom, do you have anything for us tonight? Um, nothing too major. I can tag on to a few of the other items kind of related to the last discussion. Um, if you are interested, um, Southside Substance Solutions uh, with Ann Stewart um, <clears throat> are working with the fire department to uh, get Narcan out to anyone who would like to have it. In fact, Ann will deliver it to your house. It is free from the fire department and do a quick little training um, just to have on hand in case um, anything were to happen. I know, unfortunately, in, you know, I live on Gates kind of by High Street. Um, there was someone who had overdosed um, a couple months ago on, the, on our street, um, and I had gone out and helped uh, with it, and the fire department showed up. Fortunately, the person was fine um, after they were administered Narcan, but if I had had it at my house, I could have administered it um, and potentially save a life. So, um, I'm going to be working with that. So you can actually get it at the firehouse on Green Lawn, just across the river, or uh, just let Ann know and she will get you uh, a dose of that. So um, that's an item out there. Um, as far as other updates, um, commission continues. We've actually had a fairly light month or two here. So not a lot of reports um, from that end. I'm trying to think if there's anything other. Oh, um, UIRF. So one of the items, Mark, that you'd brought up was lighting and, and pedestrian stuff. That's really falling under public services. Um, there is a UIRF list, which is the um, urban renewal funds list um, that we are working through some updates of adding sidewalks where there's not sidewalks 
adding lighting where there's not currently lighting. Um, so Erin Sink, who's usually on these meetings, is the chair of that committee, and I'm closely with her on that, um, to identify those locations. If there is a location that, that you know of that, you know, a sidewalk just ends for a block and then doesn't pick up, um, you know, feel free to, to email Erin and I, and we'll get that on the UIRF list for installation. Um, there's additional funding that's, that's likely to start coming through for other items um, through the city. So we're also making a prioritized list of additional projects. Um, you may be aware of the, um, you know, the latest COVID bill that was passed through the Senate and signed into law, um, did include some additional funding for infrastructure purposes, um, including some uh, you know, alternative transportation, uh, you know, which is bikes and walking and that kind of thing. Um, so that has some uh, criteria tagged to it that the city could potentially see some funds and come, and with that too is the uh, urban city uh, assistance funds that were part of that as well to help make up some shortfalls and tax revenue and, and other things. So all of those kind of play to some increased city budgets in some areas, looking at some additional uh, funding of projects. So we have a kind of prioritized list throughout all of the South side, not just Marion Village. Uh, of a number of projects that we're working through with the city to get into their capital improvement plans. Um, let's see, I think that's, that's most of it. Um, if there are any other questions, then I'm happy to answer as well, but I think that's all. As always, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, okay, we're gonna jump back to the beginning of the agenda now and have our treasurer's report, treasurer's report excuse me, um, from our treasurer, Eric. Hey, thanks, Jess. Um, sorry, everybody, for being held in this late. Um, so if we start off on um, the balance sheet, Jess, do you have the, yeah, perfect, okay. So uh, on the balance sheet, we have um, around $750 in checking, um, a little over $20,000 in savings, and then petty cash remains unchanged. Um, if, I will call your attention down in the um, funds and the grants. Um, we did create an education fund. This is um, due to the residual from the Southwood Elementary fundraiser that we had done, we had, uh, we did back in the fall. Um, so we raised a little uh, shy of $2,000 uh, and then um, uh, all that Southwood actually asked us to um, donate was around $1,500. So um, if you remember um, in one of the meetings um, following, I think it was maybe November or January, we had discussed um, creating an education fund to put the remainder of that fundraiser balance. And then we'll use that for um, something related to the schools um, ongoing. So we talked about potentially, you know, either um, a teacher's dinner or um, other, you know, activities for, for um, the uh, public education in, in the South Side. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a while back, this has got to be a couple of years ago, we had asked um, about painting the Marion Village sign at the corner yes. of Midoff and High Street. Yes. I mean, the thing looks really ratty. And I thought um, the association was in the process of getting bids but nothing ever happened with that. Yeah, um, so great, great question and um, very timely. Um, now that I think we're, you know, hopefully on the um, coming out of the COVID, um, you know, uh, kind of restrictions. So we did um, get bids and we did actually um, um, hire or, or go into agreement with one of the painters to um, freshen up that, um, uh, sign. And we were going to use, I believe, part of the beautification um, grant to be able to pay for that. That was right before um, COVID hit. And so before we could um, uh, schedule that painting, um, all the lockdown happened back this time, actually it was about this time last year. And they weren't, the city wasn't doing any street closures because of that. And they weren't issuing any permits um, we would have to actually close the street down to be able to um, get the equipment underneath the sign to be able to paint it. Uh -huh. so, 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 so. This, is, this is Lauren Larrick. Um, oh, hey, Lauren, go also, ahead. Feel free to our, 
the person who uh, was our painter actually kind of backed out and oh. uh, we had, I'd kind of followed up with him, you know, when things were start, maybe starting to look better and uh, never heard back from him. So I think he was kind of scared with COVID and then really just kind of backed out altogether. Um, so now, you know, when we do pursue that again, it, we're going to have to start from the beginning with, with quotes. Um, and it is something that we're looking at if, if anyone in the beautification committee is interested in helping with that, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, so hope, hopefully to your point, Kathy, we're able to um, get that going again, but it's definitely in the works. I mean, oh, we're, okay, we're definitely great. Interested. I just didn't want it to be forgotten. No, we will definitely not forget that. We're pretty eager to get it painted as well so that we can have a nice refreshed photo for our website too. But it, yeah, the timing was just, it, Lauren had to work pretty hard to get the get people to give us quotes in the beginning. And then when we were finally ready to pull the trigger, COVID told us no. So yeah, stopped everything. It's been a challenge. One, one, one of the, the you know, many um, COVID, um, uh, you know. Uh, casualties. Casualties, yes. <laughs> All right, any other questions on the balance sheet? Okay, so moving on to the income statement, um, Jess has got that pulled up as well. So you can see that we still continue to have some uh, kind of a trickling of the residential memberships. Again, no business memberships. Um, and we've decided to uh, pause that campaign again this year um, due to COVID. Um, under donations, um, we did have um, around $108 from Kroger Community Rewards for our, our quarterly donation. And then we did have um, $75 that came in from, as I mentioned earlier, that Southwood um, scholarship, or sorry, the Southwood Elementary Fundraiser. We did have about $75 that came in late um, afterwards that we've since also, and then we'll now, anything else that comes in through that, we'll put towards that education fund. Um, we did receive um, about $120 in um, yard sale registrations for non-members um, for the re recent um, yard sale that was this past weekend, um, which then we also got about 33 cents in interest on our savings account, which brings our total income um, for the month to around $400. On the expense side, um, our usual rent and utilities um, remained about unchanged. Um, the biggest um, expenses that we've had for this last month was, um, if you remember back in the fall, we did an art installation um, kind of as part of our summer fun days. And that art installation was at um, the corner of Morrill and uh, 4th Street on the, the side of the Wonderlust Studios um, kind of wall there. Um, so that $1,400 was for the actual um, production um, of the materials. Um, they had to actually produce that and then installation. So there was around $1,400 for that art installation that went in that we did incur the cost of um, this month that we actually wrote the check about four months ago, but it finally cleared um, this month. We also paid our annual renewal for our um, web hosting services um, that host our website. Um, that was around $350. And then um, we um, had run out of yard sale signs. Um, we were down to just a fair minimum. So um, we had made the decision to go ahead and uh, invest in some new yard sale signs. So we ordered around 100 new signs that should hopefully last us for about five years. Um, and that cost around $400. So um, for the um, month, we had about um, $2,700 in expenses, which brings us to a net loss of $2,300 um, for the month. Any questions on the um, income or expense report? Okay, I do want to just make a um, make it very aware that because we are actually in the checking account for the month shows around seven hundred dollars at the end of April, and we've had some additional expenses at the beginning of May, which brings us down to about five hundred dollars. I'm going to have to transfer some about thousand dollars out of uh, savings into checking to be able to cover us for our operational cost um, for the month of May. Um, just as a, more of a safety net, um, we don't expect that we're going to incur, uh, you know, an additional $1,500, but want to just make sure that we're covered um, to avoid any non-sufficient 
um, fees uh, from the bank. So just want to make everybody aware that, that will be um, happening this month. All right. Thanks, Jess. Back to you. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Okay. All right. So there we are with that update. Um, that actually brings us just to the couple of community activities and events that are coming up. Um, so if you're not already aware of this, the Southside Market hosted by Wanderlust and Austin and Company will be running throughout the entire summer. So that will be every Saturday between May 1st, it was just last weekend, and August 28th. That is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So they'll have a variety of uh, different vendors each weekend. And I believe there'll be one food truck and typically um, music at one of the locations and like an art installation. Um, last weekend, they had a chalk artist who was doing art on the sidewalk that folks could actually collaborate with and, and come join in that project. So a lot of really cool, interesting things. Um, you can get updates from that directly from Wanderlust Studios or Austin and Company through their Facebook pages. They, they share a lot of information who to expect um, vendor wise each week. So Really cool. If you haven't checked it out, great opportunity to go find something to do on a Saturday morning or afternoon. Uh, and then, of course, the Southside Area Commission's monthly meeting will be Tuesday, May 25th from 6.30 to around 8. They hold those virtually um, as well, so anyone is welcome to attend. I think they stream them on Facebook as well, um, and you can just tune in and, and see what's going on. Otherwise, I'm going to open the floor up if anyone has any questions, comments, anything they'd like to share. I do. This is Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi. Just an unofficial update about the German Village Post Office. It's not going to reopen or, or a new location. I heard that um, all the post office boxes that were at that location at Whittier and Parsons were moved to the Lockbourne Freebus location where the 43206 mail is sorted. And so I heard the construction has started to remodel that facility. And so the um, unofficial word from the folks at the uh, Ennis Avenue post office is that that's where uh, the quote unquote German village post office will be from now on. So there was no public hearing about that as noted uh, the postmaster that sent that notice out when the building closed is no longer there. There's a substitute postmaster. There's substitute postmaster or uh, manager and supervisors at the Lockbourne office. Um, so our hopes of getting a, a local post office um, in or around Parsons in the north end of Marion Village is probably not going to happen. So you can still go to the 43207 a location at Ennis and Parsons um, for your mail needs. But if you have post office boxes for the 43206 zip code, it looks as if you're going to have to go to Lockbourne and Freebus. I think that's where it's located. I think that the dispatch, we just shared this on Facebook. I'm looking for the image to try to upload it. I believe that someone at the dispatch is collecting comments and feedback from folks in the area about this change and about the fact that there is really no walkable post office in our immediate area. Um, if I can find that, I'll certainly share that to chat, but um, I believe that they were collecting some information about that as well, just because it's, it's been a very unpopular decision, at least with the neighborhood. Well, it, it was never any any public hearing, as they said. And um, right, we wanted a walkable post office, especially for businesses along Parsons um, in the northern end of uh, Marion Village and Schumacher and German Village. Um, so maybe it will get changed, but I haven't been there. I'll have to make a trip and go and look, physically look and see if they are uh, you know, remodeling that they have taken out all their uh, post office boxes and counters from that building. That was the, uh, those items were removed quite a long time ago, probably about four, four or five months ago. Um, so that's all I heard is they're putting them in at the, at the Lockbourne um, area. 
Thanks for that, Terry. I did upload the image that was circulated. Uh, Schumacher Post Pl Schumacher Place posted this. We shared it as well. It's just some contact information for the post office and for a gentleman at the dispatch. If you have comments that you want to share, um, just to express your your feelings about it. Um, so please feel free to do that. I hope everyone can see the image that I posted there. Is someone else taking over the building that was the old post office? The building wasn't owned by the post office. I know that it was, I guess it was rented or it was a strange situation. So I'm not actually sure who currently owns it or, or what's happening with it, but um, I haven't heard anything about the plans for the future. What I heard is, um, no, the post office didn't own it. Um, and they were responsible for the maintenance, the interior maintenance of it. So when the ceiling collapsed, um, they were supposed to fix it, but they didn't. And it was, I heard it was going to be like $150,000 to do that. And they just didn't refuse to do it. And I don't know what they're going to settle with, but I heard the post office, um, does not own that property. Um, given how the, um, uh, Church for All People have taken over quite a lot of the space on uh, Whittier and uh, Parsons. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they they buy the property or, or or lease it from the current owner. They do use the parking lot. Uh, so the owner is letting them use the parking lot. Now, I'm sure they're charging, but um, they are using it because they closed it even while the post office was open because the post office wouldn't pay the rental on the parking lot. So we had to park at the gas station across the street if you drove or on the street. So we'll see what happens, but thank you for that information. And I'll, I'll send my comments in. Disappointing result, but um, thanks for everyone for your feedback in the process. And maybe someday we'll get a post office back. We can keep our fingers crossed. Anyone else have anything that they'd like to share with the group before we adjourn tonight? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So uh, just a reminder to stay safe, everyone. We hope to see you next month at our June meeting. And yeah, we'll see you all then. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jess.